Welcome to the Mobile Workforce Podcast, where we sit down and have real conversations with business leaders that have been where you are. During these interviews, we'll dive into what it takes to improve systems and champion processes that maximize performance. Each week, our trailblazing guests share their experiences and understanding of the workforce to help inspire change, challenge our thinking, and share what it takes to successfully travel the road to profitability. Now here's our host, co-founder and chief evangelist of About Time and WorkMax, Mike Merrill. Hello and welcome to the Mobile Workforce Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Merrill, and today we are sitting down for a second episode with our good friend and guest, Eric Oberempt, the president and owner of DNM Roofing and Siding, and also the podcast host of the Be Authentic or GTFO podcast. So, so Eric, last week we ended with you talking about the importance of doing the right thing and always doing the right thing. And then you also talked about having your employees have the empowerment to also always do the right thing. Now, it sounds very simple, but that can be very impactful on your culture and the way that your company is run and how your uh, customers perceive you as well. Is that all you want in your culture or is there also something more? I mean, that's that's all I want because I know that if I do that, the money will come, the jobs will come, the, the revenue will come, right? And, and I talk about this, I talk about this a lot with my, with my people. I'm like, Hey, look, everybody, the client is the, 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 the homeowner, the policy holder, the whoever, that's not my client. That's your client. You are my client. I'm only concerned about with what you're doing and how I'm trying to help you get better. Don't call me about what do we do with the shingles over at such and such or whatever, right? Like that's not, not my problem, Right. That's your problem. And my goal is that I build you up enough that you understand what would Eric do in this moment, right? Because they know that Eric would do the right thing. So that means that Tim's going to do the right thing. That means that Chris is going to do the right thing. That means that Craig is going to do the right thing, right? I'm just naming off employees, but like they, (laughs) but they're going to do the right thing. And I think that at the end of the day, that's again, that's what we're going to be judged on. And I've gotten to a point in my life, maybe it's just because I'm old, but like I've gotten to a point in my life where I, I genuinely want, I, I, I want to know how I'm going to be judged at the end of the day, right? Not, not by, not, not even by, not even by God or a higher power or whatever, you know, like whatever you believe in, but by people, how am I going to be judged by people and, and how did I shift how they interact with other people so that when they teach their kids, they continue to do the same thing. That's what's important to me. Well, that's the that's what a legacy is, right? You left something that kept going even after you were gone. Yeah, it's not about having your name on a building. And I know that that's what everybody thinks that it is, but it's not. That's not what that's not what legacy is. It, it's how many lives did you affect after you're gone? Yeah, amen to that. So how did you get to that point? So that's a that's obviously I mean, that's quite a quite a leap from you know, starting a roofing company as a solopreneur or, you know, somebody who's young and hungry and wants to go, you know, build a business. How did you get to the point where you were trusting employees and empowering them? And you mentioned building them up, which I, I love that term. Uh, what, what, tell us about that process a little bit so others might be able to learn from that. Yeah, absolutely. So I honestly, about, mm, I'll call it four years ago. I remember I was sitting down with another coach of mine because, again, here's step one. You have to invest in yourself first, right? It goes back to the old adage of, like, you got to take the oxygen first, then you can give it to your neighbor, right? But, like, I had to, I had to figure out I had to invest in myself, and I, I hired a different coach, and a business coach only, and we were, we were working on this different stuff, and he's like, well, what do you want to do? And I'm like, I want to build a self-sustaining business that it doesn't matter if I'm there, and we literally, and we had to give it a, a, a name, right? Like a, like a military name. And I, and I called it operation accountability. And we sat down and we broke down every department in my company. We're like before in my mind, I just had this one big fucking company, right? Like I didn't, I didn't sit down and take the time to like break it down into, de- into departments necessarily, even though I had definitely enough people to do that. But as a small, you know, small, medium sized business owner, 
um, I had to sit down, break down those departments and then go, okay, look, this is your world, right? I'm not going to do your job. I pay you very well to do your job. I will help you anytime you need help or you don't understand something, but this is operation accountability and you're going to be accountable for this. You're not accountable for this, but you're accountable for this. It took me two years. It took me about two years of constantly drilling that shit. We read books. We do book clubs. I made everybody read Extreme Ownership, the, 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 the uh, Dichotomy of Leadership, whatever. Yep. And then the third one, which was like the real game changer. Um, shit, I forget what the name of it was. But that the last book uh, in that little trilogy or whatever that Jocko wrote were amazing. And we would read these books together. And all they talked about was like owning your, your shit. And when I got everybody on board with that, that I wasn't the easy button anymore and that they genuinely had a role to play, it's sports, man, right? Like it always goes back to sports. You're a lineman, you're a running back, right? Like you own your lineman. Don't worry about where the running back's going or where the wide receiver. When I played football, I had no idea what route the guy was running. I didn't give a shit. You know what I gave a shit about? The guy right in front of me that I had to knock on the fucking ground, right? That's all I had to worry about. I had to worry about doing my job, knocking him down. And if we all did that on the line, if we all did our jobs, then everything else was going to happen the way that it was supposed to happen as long as everybody did their job. But if I started worrying about, well, is that, is that end blocking down and blah, 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 right? Like if I started worrying about that, then I wasn't focusing on what I was supposed to be focusing on, which was my job. And so we really dug into that really hard. And like I said, it took me a couple of years to really get everybody on board with it. But man, once I did, it completely changed the dynamic of my business. And it gave me the opportunity selfishly to move right? I didn't want to live in the cold tundra of Omaha anymore, right? We, we wanted to move and we wanted to do it before my daughter got too old and it screwed her up in school and everything else. She's, you know, seven. And I was like, if we're going to do it, let's go. And we moved, I moved, you know, 15 hours away to, you know, to Houston area. And I do zooms and meetings and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I fly back twice a month to, you know, meet with the team and do group settings and whatever. But like, it's running, right? It's a well-oiled machine and everybody knows what to do. I still got to go back and rah-rah a little bit and have conversations and make sure everybody's staying on point. That's what a leader does, right? But I don't have to be there every single day. And people listening to this that want to not only be better leaders, but better business owners and not just have a job, right? You have to get your people to take responsibility for their role and not use you as the easy button because then you're just an owner dependent company and you're not a business. You have, you, you just have a job and you're doing everybody else's job when they get stuck. I've talked about this a million times. The most successful people in my mind are figure it outers. If you can figure shit out, right? What did we do growing up? I assume we're about the same age. Maybe I don't know yeah, how old are yeah. you? Okay. 49. Yeah. Close. Okay. I'm 43, but like we grew up in the same era. Right. And, and what you had to do when you were younger is figure it out. What happened if you were, you know, back then you could ride your bike wherever the fuck you wanted, right? And that thing might break down a mile and a half, two miles from your house and you're 12 years old. What did you do? You had to figure it out, right? It wasn't like today where you knew that mommy was walking right behind you and following you the whole way, right? We might break it down in a field somewhere, God knows where, but you know what? You figured it out. You figured out how to get home. You figured out how to put that thing back together. You're on a job site, right? Best lessons I ever learned were on a job site working. Like I roofed till I was like 29, 30 years old. And you're up on that roof. There's nobody there to help you. If you come into a situation that you don't know what to do, there was no manual. There was no YouTube. There was no, none of that shit. It was, well, I guess I better figure it out. And I think that that's something that's lacking in today's world. And if there's anything that people can get, it's like strive to be somebody who figures shit out, right? Don't rely on others to do your job. Yeah. I love that. You're talking about extreme ownership, right? I think that's, that's the book we were missing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. That was the first one. Oh, sorry. There, 
there, there was extreme ownership then the, di the dichotomy of, of leadership or something like that. The last one was like something about tactics or something. If somebody can find the name of that and we can post it, whatever, that book was like the first two were amazing. That one was like, we got more lessons and more things that we implemented into our business from that book than any of the other ones that we've read in the last three years. Wow. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, you don't hear of roofing companies doing book club very often. So kudos no, to you. no. But but what I decided was I wasn't a roofing. I was a, that was my widget, mm -hmm. right? That was my widget. That's just what I happen to do. I don't care if you're an HVAC or plumbing or fucking like it doesn't matter what you're in, right? Your company is a widget. I just happen to be really good at roofing because I've done it since I was ten years old, right? So that's the widget that I'm going to continue to sell so that I can make money. But that's just the widget. I'm just I, I'm a company. That's how I make my money, but let's do everything else like a big, huge company would do, right? I'm a mid-sized company that runs processes, systems, and personal growth and development like a billion-dollar corporation. That's what I want my people to feel like. Yeah, that's beautiful. So they, so you're, you're working on a TEDx talk right now. Um, tell me about that process. Share with the listeners kind of what message and process you're going through to get that prepared. Yeah, so I'm actually just digging back into that. I, I started it right before RoofCon, and I had to table it because I had, I had way too many things going on. And it's such a different process doing a TEDx talk than it is preparing to do a keynote right? Because when you're doing a 45 minute keynote, right? I was, I was prepping for this 45 minute keynote. Then I went down to Arizona and did, I had to do a 30 minute version of that 45 minute keynote. And for people that speak, that's hard to do, right? Like people think, oh, that's so much time. No, it's really not right. Like to cram 45 into 30. And then I realized like, I was like, I can't work on this TEDx talk because it has to be a completely separate subject matter to be able to cram that into 14 minutes. Oh yeah. Right? Yeah. So, I'm actually digging back into that and and what my what my working topic is right now is I want people to learn about So again, I go back to it in recovery, right? And what my people that work for me don't know is that our business is built on the 12 steps and traditions of AA. They have no clue, right? They have absolutely no idea that our company is built on those principles and, and those steps and the things that I live on a daily basis. And I also think that employers don't know the benefit of bringing in people that have been through that. They're scared and they're like, ooh, he's a recovering alcoholic, right? Or he's a recovering addict. But are they a recovering alcoholic or addict that is recovering and is done the steps and is like working on themselves, right? That makes them such a asset, right? Such an asset because they're probably doing way more than anybody else that's working for you, right? So what I want to talk about in my TEDx talk is how I use the principles and the steps of recovery in my business and how that grew my business and gave me the opportunity to bring in other people that were do going through some of the same struggles that I went through. And not only did they become some of my highest producing people, they completely changed their lives. They completely changed their lives because not only were they working on this journey, but they, they found a home to work on it together. Right. And now, you know, and, and, and it, hopefully it'll give people it'll, it'll get rid of that stigma. Right. And I'm not saying, Hey, go hire the, the meth addict down the fucking street. Right. Like I'm not, I'm not saying do that. Like I'm not going to do that, but, but it's about not being afraid of that stigma that's associated with recovering alcoholics. Right. I mean, I was a shit show. I was a nightmare. Nobody would have ever thought that I would end up where I'm at today and doing the things that I, that I'm doing today. And if it wasn't for that person that gave me another chance, if it wasn't for that person that that led me through, you know, getting sober, if it wasn't for that person believing in me, I'd probably, I, I'd 100% be dead or in jail, right? And I want to give those people the same opportunity and give business owners the opportunity to learn those same things that I learned to be able to implement into their business. 
Yeah, that's beautiful that you're applying those principles that changed your life in business. I mean, it's uh, it's it reminds you what like Jocko and Leif Babin do with their military experience in the SEALs teams, right? Yeah. And apply it to business. And yeah, it, I never really works. thought of it that way. Yeah, I never thought work. of it that way, but that's exactly what it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's. I'm going to use that, so I'm stealing that shit. <laughs> that's Thank okay. you. Hey. That's okay. No, it's it's brilliant what you're doing though, because these are these are true principles. They're not. It's not just somebody's idea. It's it's things that actually work. It just makes sense. So it's uh, awesome, awesome what you're doing. And it's funny because I I've said this a few times. I don't know if I said it on stage or not, but. It's funny because all of these personal growth and development, like retreats and exercises and all this shit that you do, right? And I've done tons of them, right? I've done tons of them. And I go and I sit in these rooms or I sit on a beach or, you know, in a house, in a jungle, whatever it is, and we're doing this shit and they'll tell you, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to do this and it's going to cause this and we're going to do this. And I sit there and I'm like, that's that's fucking four step guys. Like you just, you just stole that shit from AA. Like you don't even know it, right? Like they have no idea that a lot of the stuff and personal growth and development stuff that we're all doing today, all kind of started in 1932 with Dr. Bob and Bill. And you know what I mean? Like that's really where it is. And it's funny because a lot of those principles have just came into the mainstream. It's just not talked about because they, they don't want to have the stigma that it came from that but they're all just principles that we should be living by anyway so i'm gonna call it out right and let everybody know that that's what it is and that that it's okay and that's why we should be giving some people second chances no that's beautiful i absolutely love that so so you've got i mean you've talked about coaches multiple times in this discussion how important are coaches to you and what would you tell people that think Oh, that's weird, or that's not for me, or that's that's not you know I'm masculine. I don't need a coach. I mean, what what do you think of when people try and poo poo that idea? I think you're an idiot. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I I I, th I I honestly do. I think that if you think you know everything and you don't need help from somebody, you're a fucking idiot. And and uh, that being said, I have moments in my life though where. I'll have that feeling. I'm like, oh, well, I learned everything that I'm going to need to learn. You know what I mean? Like, look at all this wealth of knowledge that I've just, that I've just amassed. Right. And I'm like, I don't need help from anybody else. And I'll go through like a, a two month little cycle of that. I will. And then I realize that it's ego, right? It's all ego messing with me because I know that I don't, I don't, I don't like, I know a lot, but I sure shit don't know everything. Right. And, and if I'm going to continuously like want to be better, it, it's about going to a conference, right? It's about going to a roof con. And if you go there for three days and you take one thing out of it that you get to implement into your life and into your business, it was worth whatever you paid to be there, the time and the money, right? So having a coach is the same thing because they're going to see things from the outside looking in that you can't see on the inside, right? You can't see it. And depending on who your employee base is, you probably got a lot of yes men around you that aren't going to be honest with you all the time and be like, hey man, you're doing this, right? I need somebody that isn't afraid because I'm a pretty large personality, right? Like people don't want to get into a fucking fight with me, like a confrontation. You know what I mean? Like that's not going to be fun. And, and I, I, I have this, or I usually come in with a perma, or, you know, like I've just got that look on my face. I try not to, right. I try to smile and I'm not an asshole. Like I'm really not, but I know that I have that demeanor, but I've got people in my life and I had to pay for them. Mm. Some of them. And not right? cheap probably either. Right. No, none of Not the good ones. Right. Like you can find somebody cheap but they're going to be shit because they haven't been through anything. Right? So when you vet a coach, here's some advice. When you, when you, when you vet a coach before you hire somebody for 5,000 a month or, you know, 10,000 a month or whatever it is that you're paying, find out what they've done and what they have fucked up because the best coaches have done some dumb shit and screwed up and then figured out how to do it right. Right. My current coach just went through a three year screw up with an app that he built. Right. Like he spent half a million dollars on this app.
that he's probably not going to recoup all the money from. But then what did he do? He flipped it, turned it into something else, turned it into a bigger business, and then he will, right? And so I get to learn that lesson from him and go, oh, so if that happens, you can do this. You know what I mean? Like, I would have never thought, I would have never thought of, of that, right? And, and, and here's the other cool thing is that when you do work with a coach for an extended period of time and you don't go, oh, I'm going to work with them for six months and then I'll get everything that I need out of them, right? But when you work with somebody for an, uh, an extended period of time, what's really cool is when you see them start getting shit from you, right? That's fun because then that's what gives you the confidence to say, you know what, maybe I can help other people. That's, that's a lot of fun, right? And I'm not saying I teach my coach, but I know that there's things that I do that he goes, oh shit, maybe, you know what I mean? Like, and now we've become equals, but we're learning from each other, right? When I first became friends with Sam, I had to pay to be Sam's friend, to be in the circle, to go to retreats, to learn shit, right? Now we're just buddies, right? I call him up and say, hey, we're going to Mexico. You want to come? And he's like, fuck yeah, I'll see you there. Right. Like that's when it turns into that, that's when, you know, you're turning a corner and now you need to, now you got to up your game again. Right now you got to find who's that next one. Who's that next one that has more information that I don't have. And that's the fun part because I'm going through that right now, trying to figure out who's that next one, right? Who's that next person that I need to get close to and I'll, I'll pay, I'll pay for it but who's that next person I need to get close to, to learn from, right? It goes back, John Maxwell. That guy is 197 years old and, <laughs> and he still sits on stage and says, every day I'm learning, every day I'm talking to people and asking them questions. What the fuck does John Maxwell need to learn, right? Well, according to him, something, right? And if he truly believes that, if he's not full of shit, Right? Maybe he is. I don't think so. Maybe he is. But if he truly believes what he's saying to people on stage, then that man is like the epitome of what all of us should be, is continuously learning in, in, until they dig our hole. Continuously learn, because if you don't, then what's, what's even the point of being here? Yeah, and he's taking his learnings and giving back. I mean, what, 92nd, 93rd book or something he was talking about? It's just amazing that what, what he keeps... You know, his cup runneth over, but he's using that excess to fill everybody else's cup. Which Who writes that many books? It's crazy. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's insane. Yeah. I mean, he's just, he, he's the shining example of that 100%. Yeah. yeah, totally agree. So you've, you've talked a lot about different leadership methods. What is, uh, what's an approach or something, just, you know, something quick that maybe the listeners can take away from that you've learned is effective for you and your business? I mean, I, I'll always go back and, and, and pitch my wares, right, of, of, of the team method, right? I mean, I'm, I'm going all in on the team method. I'm going to trademark the goddamn thing. I'm going to, like, I'm going to go out and speak on it and, and try and teach as many people as I can because I think if you, lead, if you lead with trust, empathy, authenticity, and you give meaning to your people, you will completely change lives, right? And obviously, that is an our keynote right? Like with stories and, and, and examples and, and whatever. But if you don't take the time, uh, to, to initiate trust in your life and in your people, if you don't understand what empathy is, right? Because here's the thing, and I, I'll say this really fast. Most people don't know the difference between empathy and sympathy. They don't, right? They think that they do, but a lot of times they'll use those words interchangeably and, and, and they're not the same thing at all. And I think that finding empathy, ever since I started this authenticity like journey, what I learned about myself was that I, I, I love being learning how to be more empathetic even more than I love being authentic, right? The more empathy that I'm able to show people, the more things I learn. Right. I have peep, I have conversations with people from different cultures or different lifestyles or different whatever it is, right? Different religions, different backgrounds. And and I don't walk in and judge and say, what are you doing? Right. Like I try not to. I mean, eh, I do it, but I try not to, right? And when I sit down and say, 
talk to me about that. Like I a hundred percent do not agree with you. Right. But I'd like to learn where you're coming from. And maybe at the end, I'll still have my opinion. I'll still believe in what I believe, but now I understand that they're actually coming from a good place. They're not just this batshit crazy person that we all thought they were because on social media, everything has to be divisive and you have to hate somebody if they don't agree with what you're saying, right? But if I can actually understand where that person's coming from, and I think that the best example of this was during COVID, right? 100% during COVID. I have very staunch beliefs on what I believe when it comes to COVID. And I'm assuming everybody here listening to me can fucking guess what those are, right? But I, I, I would assume. But, but I have other people in my life that have different viewpoints that I don't agree with, but I want to understand because I know that they're good people, right? And I want to listen and be like, okay, still don't agree with you, but I love you. And, and, and I hope that you're okay. You know what I mean? Like, and I hope that you're okay. And if you ever need anything from me, I'm here, right? And if you want to understand where I'm coming from, we'll talk about it, but it's not about me. And that's the lesson. It's not about you when you're trying to be empathetic shut the fuck up and listen. Learn to listen to other people so that that will make you better, right? People want to be around people that are empathetic and listen. They don't want to be around people that have to be right all the time. Well, that, yeah, the thought that comes to mind, I'm sure you've heard this before too. Um, there's a, they say, you know, listen to people to understand, not to respond. You know, um, I think a lot of times we're, we already have the answer we want to get out and we just can't wait to say it before they even finish talking. It's like, because you have to win. Right. Because you have to win and you have to be right. Like you don't, you can just own your opinion and own your shit and, and, and listen. Right. And again, it goes back to the very beginning of this podcast when you started talking about social media and you started talking about all the different platforms that are out there that give people an opportunity to speak. Right. And that's great that, you know, like, thank God for it, right? Because it's giving you a platform to, to reach all these people. And it's giving me a platform to reach all these people. But it's also giving other people a platform to divide, right? And I think that it's our job as the people that you and I are trying to be to make sure that we are as loud as them, Yeah. right? Plus we one. have to be. <laughs> Plus one. <laughs> right. We have to be as loud. We have to be as loud about being better and about coming together and that we're more alike than we are different. And, and we have to be able to make sure that people are hearing that because the way the algorithms work, you only hear what you agree with. And I hate that. I hate that. I will, I will purposely go out and read shit on CNN right? I might get angry reading it for a minute, <laughs> right? But, but, but I do that because like, I want to, I want to, I want to understand. And sometimes it's crazy. Sometimes it's not whatever, but like, I want to have those conversations and I want to, I want to be better. And I want, I want people to understand me, but I want people, I want to understand other people too. And I think that if we, if enough of us keep doing that, we can change things. Well, and when you do that, you're opening yourself up to a different perspective that you're not going to get in the usual places you're getting and consuming your information. So if you want to you understand not just what I believe or, or, or how I feel, but why do I feel that way? Or what, why, why do I believe that? Is this, is this right? Or am I crazy? Or have I been, have I been duped? I mean, let, let's own it and figure out, you know, are your, are your feet firmly planted where they are because you choose to plant them there? Or is that because that's where they were, bef were there before. And now you're just kind of going with the flow. And is this where your parents planted your feet? Right. Exactly. Yeah. You know, that's, that's exactly it. Cause we right? all came exactly. up from somewhere. Right. Right. I mean, people that, I mean, it, like the biggest one in that is, is religion, right? You're, you're, you're born and your parents tell you what the fuck you are and don't really give you generally, right? That most people don't get this opportunity until they're into their twenties to explore, right? And I'm not saying like eight year olds should be able to go out and you know whatever, like that's fine. But you don't get this opportunity until you're kind of out of the house to to learn, right? And and to your point, you just 
am, am I making decisions based on what I believe and what I feel based on research and data and you know, whatever, or is it because this is what so-and-so told me? And I've just, that, and I've been indoctrinated with that. I know that's a bad word to use, but, but you, you understand what I'm trying to yeah, say. Yeah, sure. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same, it's the same in business. It's the same in, in everything, you know, are we, you know, it's something we hear all the time, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And it's like, well, yeah, it's been broke a long time. It was broke before you got it and you're keeping it broke. So yeah, you need to fix it, man. Like you need to adopt technology. You need to embrace change. You need to lean into something new and innovative and different than what you've been doing because what you're doing, yeah, you're doing fine, but you're not like you said, until you, until you really, you know, challenge something or until you really break the mold or, or put yourself out there, nothing amazing is going to happen. No. And at the, yeah, at, at the end of the day, um, one more piece of advice is what we do in our company is at the end of every year, December ish time, it slows down. It's cold. You know, where our office is up in Omaha and we, we have a, we have a session takes a week, two weeks, whatever it is. And we break down everything that didn't work. And then we figure out how to change it for the next season and make it better. Right. And then we're like, man. And when you get done with that, you're like, figured it out. We fought, <laughs> we fought, we got it. Right. It's like golfing, right? You have two or three shots. You're like, figured it out. Got that. How could I screw up now? Right. And and we change processes and systems and whatever, right? As a business owner, you have to do this. And then we'll go through that whole next th season thinking, man, like we are prepared. And then the end of that year comes and it's like, whew, about five things broke down that we need to fix. And maybe there's, to your point, maybe there's some software, maybe there's some integrations, maybe there's some something new that we need to add so we don't fall behind, right? So it's not even a matter of, is it broke? It's a matter of, it's gonna fucking break, right? It's going to break if you don't maintain it and continue to make it better every single year, right? You got to maintain your business. Don't let it break by continuously coming up with new processes, new softwares, new ideas, right? Don't let people not talk and give you those ideas. Yeah. And sometimes the best thing that can ever happen is it does break and it breaks bad. And now you're forced to do something that you weren't willing to do on your own without, without being kind of, you know, up a crick without a paddle. Right. But, but how much nicer would it be if we didn't have to let yeah, it break? Yeah. yeah. Exactly <laughs> right. Exactly right. I've learned all my best lessons from shit burning to the ground, <laughs> but if I can avoid that at all costs, like I'm going to do that. So I need to put in a little bit of work to try and avoid. I tell my team guys, if you could help me put shit out, put out fires with a, water hose instead of a fire hose mm, Love that. <laughs> like our life is going to be so much easier because if it gets to me we're breaking out the fire truck you're hearing fire engines yeah <laughs> right like you're going to hear sirens if i get involved but if you can take a garden hose and put these fires out like everybody's life is going to be a lot better but so you let them use those little hoses early on so they knew when to use them and weren't afraid to ask and wait around until the flames got so big, you got to bring the truck in. Yeah. If you don't trust your people, you either need to get more people or you need to figure out why you don't trust these people. Cause it might be about you and not them. Mm. Oh, that's good. That's gold. So this has been super fun. I, I, I think we could go on for another couple hours. Probably yeah, uh, maybe probably. We'll have to do one down the road again. But uh, if there was one takeaway that you wanted to share with the listeners and something you really hope that they have as a call to action, what, what would that message be? Well, completely selfish and self-promoting before I end any podcast, I always have to mention our nonprofit roofers in recovery. Um, so we started a nonprofit about uh, three and a half, four years ago called roofers in recovery, where we raise money throughout the year uh, to be able to send people to treatment. Uh, Paul Reed and I uh, started it back like I said, about four years ago, we both went to treatment and that saved our lives and made us into the people that we became today. And we want to be able to give that opportunity to other people. And so on June 2nd, this year is National Roofers and Recovery Day. So for anybody in roofing, solar, whatever it is, we at, we're asking people to participate and build a roof or put a solar deal on or whatever it is on that day. 
document the shit out of it. We're going to put it in our documentary that we're filming and donate the profit from the roof, right? Pay your subs, pay your suppliers, right? And then donate the profit on that one day so that we can have this one large day so that we can reach our goal of being able to have the ability to send 50 people a year to treatment. And we need to raise about a million dollars. We need about 150 to 200 contractors to sign up. Um, and I know that that's not something that we talked about. It's not a leave behind, whatever, but like every time that I'm on camera speaking to anybody, I want people to know about roofers and recovery. You can go to roofersandrecovery.com. Um, and please like become part of that. If you're in the construction space and you're in recovery, come find us. We have meetings on Tuesdays and Thursdays virtually. We meet up like we did at, Ro at RoofCon. I, we had meetings in the morning just to form that community. We've got a Facebook group and everything. And like, we've literally built this really cool community of people in the construction and roofing space that can bond and, and, and have a safe place uh, to exist uh, when we go to events like this. So please, if you're in that space, um, please connect with me about that. I don't make money off of that. Like I'm not pitching wares or anything like that. I just want to make sure that the people out there uh, know about it so that they know that there's a safe place to go, um, whether they need help or they want to help. Right. Um, and then leave behind. I think the biggest thing, you know, I appreciate you bringing up authenticity, bringing up, you know, the, t the team method, letting me talk about the team method. I think that if, if people sit down and take the time to don't look at your people first, look at you right? Look at you and say, am I instilling trust? Am I giving empathy? Do I have the quality of empathy? Am I authentic to who I am all the time and not trying to be somebody else just because the situation dictates it? And am I giving meaning to the people in my company? Do I care about what they care about? Right? Like, and I, and again, I could go on for five days coaching about that. Right. But if you, if, if you hear those terms and you go, and you kind of, your stomach fucking goes in a little bit and you're like, I don't know if I really do that. Take a, take a look at yourself because maybe it's not your people failing. Maybe it's you failing. Because if you figure those things out and you give that to your people, now you get to have a business and you can stop having a job. Oh, I love that. Beautiful. Well stated. And, and uh, just so much admiration for the great work you're doing both you know, abroad and uh, in these groups that you're, that you're a part of, as well as, you know, this, this amazing charitable contribution and work that you're doing to help roofers in recovery. And we'll certainly promote that out and, and hopefully draw some more attention to that for you. Uh, it's been so much fun. Uh, enjoyed getting to know you better and look forward to doing this maybe again down the road and, and connecting up. When we have the opportunity. Absolutely. I'm always available for you. All right, brother. Appreciate you. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Thank you for joining us today on the Mobile Workforce Podcast, sponsored by About Time Technologies and WorkMax. If you liked the conversation we had today or were able to learn anything new or helpful, please make sure to follow us on our WorkMax page on LinkedIn and on Instagram at WorkMax underscore. And subscribe to the show on iTunes or your preferred podcast platform so you will never miss another insightful episode. Also, if you enjoyed the podcast, please leave us a five-star rating and review and share the show with your friends and colleagues. Your support means the world to us and will allow us to continue providing impactful information with others looking to improve their results in their business and in turn, their life.